Thank you. So as should be obvious from that introduction, I'm not an optical guy. I'm the internet guy. When Ed asked me to talk, I said, but I'm not an optical guy. And he said, well, we always like to have one stray. And uh, actually, my talk will follow very nicely from the previous one because, um, well, I am the end to end guy, too, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I am a technologist with increasing concerns about the larger social and economic and regulatory constraints that are defining the internet. Um, my colleagues think I've gone crazy. I now hired not only an economist to work for me, but a political scientist. And uh, what I want to talk about is the future. But I'm not going to make predictions. I think it's dangerous to make predictions. I think the right way to think about the future is what are the bounds, what are the constraints. And again, I'm going to tell you, clearly some of them are technical. You know that very well. But a lot of them are, in fact, around the economics. Furthermore, although I'm the internet guy, I want to stress not everything that's happening here is on the internet. I'm willing to bet you in 10 years most of the packets that are being sent will be inside IP headers and they won't be the public internet. The other thing I want to say is I'm not going to talk about data centers. I'm not a data center guy. I'm a wide area guy. I think the issues for your industry in those two spaces are entirely different. And what I'm really concerned about is how are we hooking up the world. So having said that, I was mindful of the question that our children ask when we first get in the car. Are we there yet? We're going through a massive transition now in which we are replacing all of the copper pairs in the world with fiber. We're replacing microwave links with fiber. At some point, will we be done? Is this a transient? Copper lasted for like five decades once they put it in. There's an interesting question. You know, we've now burned through the dot-com exuberance, and we're going to need some more capacity. But at some point, does this sort of top out, or does it just keep growing forever? And I want to look a little bit at those issues. And in particular, I want to look at not just the issue of capacity, but the issue of ubiquity. But I'll come back to ubiquity. I'm going to start with capacity. So I said, I'm not going to predict the future, but here's somebody who does. And I suspect from the back of the room, this is nothing but an eye chart. This is data from a company called Sandvine. Uh, Sandvine makes these boxes you hook to your network if you want to engage in things that are called not being network neutral. Um, they do deep packet inspection. And Sandvine gathers data from all of their uh, customers and rolls it up. And if you can't read the graph from the back of the room, there's one obvious thing, which is it goes up. right? And if you can see the colors, those are coded as to the type of behavior. And the red one, which is at the bottom and dominates the picture, it starts at about 58% and it goes to 66% is real-time entertainment. That is to say, streaming media and, of course, video dominates audio in terms of bytes. So if you want to know what that is, Netflix today is one-third of all the internet traffic flowing to the consumer's house. You throw in YouTube, you're up to 50%, and the rest of it is stuff like Hulu. Okay. So the first thing from this graph is it goes up. I said these people gather data, but it's important to remember this is not data. This is hallucination, right? You probably cannot read the little labels on the bottom of the slide, but the first one says the first half of 2013, and all of the graphs after that have a little E after them, which stands for estimate, which is a polite word for hallucination. <laughs> Here's another graph. This is from Cisco, the Visual Networking Index. And again, the takeaway message is it goes up. Okay. What should we conclude from these pictures? Well, the first thing we should conclude from looking at them, these are predictors of exponential growth. To, to mutate an old expression that used to be about IBM, nobody ever got fired in this industry for predicting exponential growth. Uh, now, in fact, if you look at those pictures, the growth rates differ. If you study the data, I just put up eye candy, but if you study the data, from Cisco, the rate of growth is actually flattening out a little bit. It's not as much out until they think it's sort of flattening out. But it's clear if it's going to grow like this, we're not done yet, at least in parts. And I'll come back to what I mean by the parts. But I want to stress this is mostly video streaming. And so the question is, well, why is this going to happen? It doesn't have to happen, OK? 
This is a prediction of demand. There is no commitment on the part of the service providers to meet that demand. Right? To meet that demand, they have to spend money. You would love to have them spend money because then they're buying something from you, right? And you want to sell them product. Notice, by the way, Cisco wants to sell you product, right? I mean, that's a graph from somebody who wants to sell you something, right? I, I had a very interesting conversation. There's a word we toss around. I don't know what it means. It was called service. I was talking to ISPs. They said, don't tell me about technology. Tell me about services. And I said, okay, I don't understand. I'm not speaking your language. And I finally got it. Here's a, a service is something that a, that a service provider can sell. Technology is something they have to buy, right? And at any level, there are services and there are technologies. And they love services and they hate technology because they have to pay for technology, but they can sell services. So to meet demand requires that they expend CapEx, right? And here's the question, OK, what's the driver? Now, the comment about end-to-end -end really gets at the issue here, OK? When my use at home doubles, okay, because all of a sudden I've watched Netflix, I'm paying Netflix, but the thing Mr. Comcast notices, I'm still paying him $45 a month and his usage just doubled. Okay. So what are the drivers of investment today? Why are ISPs actually investing? And I'm looking now very much at the, the consumer experience, the residential experience. Well, there are three answers today that I can identify. One's competition, one's return on investment, and one is new users. And what I'm going to say, and by the way, I'm not a pessimist. I'm an optimist. I agree with him. But a little, yeah, OK, so I'm going to tell you some, 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 some stories about edgy stuff here, OK? All three of these drivers are problematic, OK? And notice I am talking today about what in the jargon is called outside plant. That doesn't mean you have to be a telephone company. It's just the stuff that's outside. It could be HFC. It can be, well, we'll come back to wireless later. OK. What about competition? This is a US-centric slide. Well, competition's fading. I live in Boston, and we have Verizon with Fios, and we have Comcast with Xfinity. And they're really competing. I love the TV ads. They make fun of each other, and they each you know that Verizon has a cable clown. And you know, they have, it's great ads. OK, but notice what Verizon did. They just suspended investment in Fios, right? They've said, we're not going to, we're going to meet our commitments. We're not going to build out at least for a while. AT&T with Uverse said, well, we're going to do what we committed to, but we're going to stop. Why'd that happen? Because they couldn't get a return on investment. Their investors told them to stop. Mm, OK, well, actually, for Verizon and AT&T, they have a great future being a mobile company, right? So we understand that. Um, I think the cable companies may be left as the winners, but that means we're moving from a stage of intense competition to a stage that looks more like uh, a single provider in, most, in many areas. Now, what about return on investment? I already told you the answer to that. This is, this is the idiot's guide to return on investment. If I pay Comcast $45 a month, whether or not they upgrade, then the return on investment for the upgrade is zero, QED. By the way, I'm quoting people in industry on that point of it. They need to understand how to participate in the value, which is exactly the last talk. Okay, they have to figure out how to participate in the value. Okay, we'll come back to that. The third is, of course, new users. We've went through this period, you know, what, 2000. People thought that broadband meant ISDN, right? It really has been on a Moore's Law curve. But that's a transition in which we got the households in the US onto broadband. We're now up to 67, 68, something like that percentage of houses. What about those other 22? They don't want the internet. They are unbelievers. Okay. But if we got them in, it would only be another 20% growth. And then we've wired every house. So that $45 a month which was growing because we were getting new users, that's beginning to flatten out. Well, any business school person will tell you what the curve looks like. It goes, whoop, and that's got a steep spot, and then it flattens out. That's saturation. Everybody knows that. We're beginning, at least in the US, to saturate. OK, so, so the question is, well, if new users aren't driving your investment and return on investment isn't driving your investment, and you don't feel quite as much competitive pressure as you used to, what's going to happen in this world? Now, operators do upgrade. Of course they upgrade. But they do it in a rate that reflects the natural process of modernization and cost reduction. And it's not necessarily the race that Con 
that Sandvine predicted, it's also not necessarily at the rate that these app designers would like, okay? But in truth, the app designers have always been gated by the capacity of the network. People said, did you imagine that we were gonna do video over the internet? And I said, yes, we did demonstrations of video over the internet in 1985. And then we waited for 30 years for the capacity to get there, okay? Because we weren't in charge of spending all that money. 4K video, well, it'll happen whenever it happens. 8K video, it'll happen whenever it happens, okay? So I put dysfunction on the slide, and you'll notice I'm sort of getting at the same thing that Gary was. Providers of higher level content are dependent on investment by ISPs, but aside from peanuts, like Netflix is now apparently paying Comcast a little bit to connect, but it's minuscule. They don't pay or invest in the ISPs, and this, now, I was talking to somebody earlier, should we have done it differently? Okay, the answer is, well, if we'd done it differently in the beginning, the internet would have never happened because the fact that there was just this platform and complementers, as the business school people would say, can innovate on this platform without worrying about whether there's capacity or whether the consumer's gonna worry about the usage. This is what made it happen because it's an experience good, as the economists would say. But, so, this was critical. This structure was critical. But you have to understand its downside, and we have to decide how we're going to work through this in the next 10 years. Now, those previous comments were US-centric. Notice, specifically with respect to competition, different things are happening in different parts of the world. In US, we, we said, well, we're going to free the operators from a lot of regulation, and we hope they'll compete head-to-head. -head. So we had fiber competing, fiber belonging to Verizon competing with fiber belonging to uh, Comcast in the Boston area. The approach in Europe, in the European Union, was to unbundle the facility and require the owner of the facility to sell it to his competitors at a regulated price. And the question there is, why should a facility's owner invest in upgrades? They're the ones putting their capital at risk, but if it's successful, they have to sell it to their competitors, who, of course, didn't take that risk. And, of course, if you look at the developing world, competition is not the issue. The question in the developing world is, how can we get anything built at all? Now, that, of course, would bring us back to the model of wireless and mobile, and I want to talk about wireless and mobile for just a minute because it's clear there's tremendous growth in mobile. So here's another graph from Sandvine. And I could, especially if you're in the back of the room, say, here's one just like the other one. Doesn't it look like the other graph? The bottom part's red and it goes up. Okay. Okay. Real-time entertainment is the red stuff, 61.8. By the way, as I said, at home, most of that stuff today is Netflix. It's long form movies and TV shows, 30 minute TV shows. People are not watching television. They're not watching Netflix. And Sandvine actually has the data. They're not watching Netflix on their mobile device, okay? This is YouTube. They're watching short form videos. They're amusing themselves by watching dancing cats for 10 minutes or 10 seconds or something like that. So you get an application level, watch the user. They're doing very different things on mobile, okay? but both curves go up. So is this good or is this bad? Well, one thing I'm sure you cannot read is the numbers on the left-hand axis over there. Uh, they are in petabytes per year. We're gonna have to learn to say some new things, okay? We've gotta say zettabytes and exabytes and yottabytes, okay, learn those words. But because you can't read the numbers, here's the important thing, okay? Both curves look exponential, but if you looked out in 2018, what Sandvine predicts for fixed usage was 240,000 petabytes per year, and they predicted for mobile 9,000 petabytes per year, 3%. If you look today at the behavior of mobile users and fixed users, monthly usage for a mobile user is running around 1% of fixed. Okay. A friend of mine trying to describe the importance of mobile in driving both the consumption of bandwidth and the competitive landscape called mobile, the great gray hope. Okay. Why are these issues? Well, because in fact, the wireless people have capacity issues and that translates into cost. This question of whether you pay by the byte or you pay flat rate, flat rate has a problem. It doesn't translate into a revenue stream to the ISP when I use more data. On the other hand, it's been an incredibly empowering thing for the creation of new apps. Users clearly 
self-censor what they do in the mobile experience. They don't watch movies on Netflix. Nobody but an idiot would watch a movie on a mobile thing which you've got two gigabytes a month, okay? Because one movie and you've blown your monthly quota, okay? Now, how are we gonna deal with exponential demand? What I'm saying here is controversial, and I'd love to have somebody come up and talk to me afterwards and tell me I'm, I'm confused. I think with respect to the last mile, or if you want to be consumer-centered, the first mile, which is a much better way to put it, once we have fiber to the X, where X could be the home, the curb, the cabinet, the whatever you want to do, I think you've actually got capacity that's going to last you for decades. Okay, you can argue about that. You will upgrade the equipment. The place where you're going to have to increase capacity is in your metro and your long-haul networks. I did a very rough estimate. I said, what happens if all of the video which the typical family today watches moves from its current model, which is broadcast, to the worst possible in terms of bandwidth consumption, I'm sorry, the best possible from bandwidth consumption, and say it uses the most bytes, which is unicast on demand for everything. And I tried to figure out for a typical cable company what would be required in their metro net to deliver that. And my estimate was they'd have to increase the capacity by a factor of 40. Which, if you had to do it in three years, is very scary. If you had to do it over 10 years, is, well, yeah, sure, that's the sort of thing that happens, right? But what about the mobile guys? They have a really serious problem. I just drew you an exponential curve. They have to deal with exponential demand. Like they don't have to, they can just ignore it. They can just let the applications wither, okay? But assuming they want to respond, how are they gonna do it? Going and getting more spectrum is not an exponential response. There isn't more, exponentially more spectrum, no matter how many technical nuclear lobbyists you fire at the FCC. Um, Spectrum response is a linear response. Now, of course, that helps because it slows down the rate at which you have to implement your exponential response. But the only answer I see is exponentially smaller cells, okay? Spectral reuse, okay? Now, that's actually important from the point of view of people who build wireline systems, okay? Because what I just told you is that in the limit, a cellular system is a wireline system. Fiber to the small cell, it's another definition of C, <laughs> okay? Fiber to the cell. And this is happening today. The end point is obvious. It's when the consumer puts a Wi-Fi node, the cellular people have a really funny word, they call it offload, Wi-Fi offload, as if it was, oh, it was my traffic, but I'm gonna give some of it to them because I can't handle it. That's not the way the consumer thinks. The consumer doesn't think that they are owned by the cellular company, they bought an iPad. And sometimes it sends traffic over the cellular system when it has to, <laughs> but whenever it can, it sends traffic over Wi-Fi because they don't have to pay for usage, or if they do, they don't have to pay as much, okay. It's interesting to try to get order of magnitude numbers, and I stress, these are probably accurate to within a couple of binary orders of magnitude, but this is me pulling numbers out of the air, to put it politely. But what does fixed usage today cost for an access provider. This is not transit, this is lot long haul, this is you're serving people in the home. Depending on what you told your accountants to do, you can make this number bigger or smaller, but you know, I said 10 cents a gigabyte. In the mobile, what's the current answer? Well, they're pushing down toward a dollar a gigabyte, 10 times as much. Does that mean that small cells are gonna cost a dollar a gigabyte? Or does it mean that small cells are going to approach the cost of fiber to the X. What's the issue here? Well, of course, one of the issues is that other word I had on my slide earlier, which was ubiquity. Cellular guys who are dealing with mobile population have an interesting problem. They really have to put up towers everywhere, and most of them are hardly used at all. And then the ones in downtown San Francisco are horribly overloaded. Okay. They talk about typical loadings, average loadings on a cell of 15%. Okay. But fixed wireless, maybe you only put up the nodes where you have houses. So maybe the cost of this, because it doesn't deal with the mobilist, mobile version of, util, of, of ubiquitous, is actually gonna be cheaper. And maybe there will be interesting fiber build-outs in support of this. On the other hand, maybe it's already been done because maybe your wireline guys will go into this business. As I said, Verizon and companies like Verizon and AT&T already have that fiber. Maybe instead of doing fiber to the home, they're gonna do fiber to the small cell. Fixed wireless to serve the home. Okay. 
So here's an interesting question, and it's one my economist friends like to ask. Should we think of wireless, either in its mobile form, its fixed form, whatever, should we think of wireless as a substitute for wireline or just a complement? Here's an interesting point for the future of investment. If you are a smart wireline ISP, and I've met some smart wireline ISPs, you want to make sure that your customer does not move to a solution that depends only on buying a little mobile device and they abandon their wireline connection. Today we're talking about cellular cord cutters. You want to make sure that we never have a wireline cord cutter. How are they dealing with this? They are dealing with this by making sure that the fixed experience cannot be duplicated in the mobile space. Um, how do they do that? By making sure that you have so much capacity that you will do things there, like watch movies, that you can't do on your mobile device. Okay? So in fact, what's happening today is interesting. I think the possibility of a, of a cellular-only broadband experience is the phantom competitor that's getting the ISPs to invest. IP television, 4K, 8K, offer something cellular cannot match. Is this my guess? No, I've had ISPs tell me that's the way they're thinking. Okay. I said, but 4K, it increases, it hurts your, he said, oh, it hurts me, but it hurts the mobile guys so much more. Okay. Um, that's a quote, by the way. I won't tell you which ISP said that. So here's the next question. Are the curves just going to keep going up forever and ever and ever and ever? As capacity grows, new applications just keep coming. I would be a total idiot if I stood here and predicted that somebody we're going to run out of demand. We have never run out of demand. What is driving it today? Video, okay. Video is so big that everything else we do just takes a free ride. Facebook, Twitter, it's just sitting in the interstices of the video, okay? So is there something bigger? And the answer is, I only know one answer, which is more video, okay. 4K, 8K, 3D, holographic, okay. Could that top out? Here are some other application areas which I think are really exciting. And I think it's interesting to take each of these and map them onto the last talk you just heard, which is how can the network help? Internet of Things, I think it's very, very cool, but most of those things have very little to say. You know? I have a sensor on my furnace. I really like the sensor on my furnace. It tells me when it stops working. It sends me a message once a year. Okay? Internet of Cars, that's clearly going to happen. Okay. What do cars have to say to each other? Very little, and they're very, it's very local, as in, I'm coming up to an intersection at 30 miles an hour, and you're coming up to the same intersection at right angles at 30 miles an hour. One of us should stop. Okay. And by the way, I've seen a demo of that. I was out at General Motors, and they drove two cars at each other at right angles, and one of them stopped. It's really cool. But okay. I hate the word cloud. It sort of creates this fuzzy impression that there's something fluffy out there. If you've ever seen the Googleplex, it's not fluffy, right? It's this huge building sit sitting next to the dam on the Columbia River, Port of the Dalles, and the, the power lines come out of the dam and they go across to the Google. Okay, there's nothing cloud about that, okay. But what does video teach us? Video teaches us is that the important thing is to get the content close to the user. Why do they do that? Well, both to improve the experience because latency and performance and all that kind of stuff, but also because they're trying to reduce the load on the network, okay. The only thing I can think of that's really going to drive the demand in this space is more video, okay? If you look at the rate at which people are uploading movies onto YouTube or videos or pictures onto uh, Facebook, you know, the visual experience is, is very compelling. So there will be continued uses of video. Always on videos, you know, nanny cams, iguana cams. I just I set up a guinea pig cam for a friend of mine. Okay, the guinea pig moves as opposed to the iguana, which didn't move. For, anyway, um, video social networking. Okay, this is just part of the constant interaction among people. You know, I actually like running Skype with the video on. It's a generational thing. I think most of the young people do. The nice thing about this, nice thing from your point of view, is it doesn't benefit from caching. It is end-to-end -end in the old-fashioned sense of the word. The video is going from me to you, and it's going in real time. I'm very concerned about latency. Now, will this happen? Yes, it will emerge, but it will emerge as the capacity as available. It does not emerge as a mandate from above. The creators of Skype cannot force Comcast to invest in the necessary capacity. 
Okay. I wanted to say just a little bit about Moore's Law, and then I'm going to wrap up. As I said, nobody ever got shot for predicting exponential growth. Moore's Law was about chips. They get about twice as good, which could either mean cheaper or denser, which is higher performance. Depending on how you read the formulation, it's 18 to 24 months. But in explaining this to non-technical people, what that means is every five years, they get 10 times better. Okay. Fibers may be on a faster curve. Disks are getting bigger. They're not getting faster. But here's the important point. If any one of the exponential stalls, it can lead to a stabilization of demand. Processors, we've made a transition from faster clocks to more cores on a chip, which means programmers are now dealing with this horrible problem of writing highly parallel programs. Parallel fibers are much less of an issue. You just put them in. So in fact, you guys are doing much better. But Moore himself predicted that we would slow down around now. And remember, Moore's law is not, again, something about physics. It's a law about return of investment. What he said is if you invest in research at about this rate, you'll get a maximum return on investment. I always like to say, what is not on a Moore's law curve? Because if everything is on a Moore's law curve except for one thing, that's just going to stick out like a sore thumb. Labor, all that construction, that's not on a Moore's law curve. Sheet metal, packaging, OK. Cost of power, electricity is not on a Moore's law curve. Batteries, batteries. When I was a kid, we had these zinc, carbon zinc cells. They sucked. If you started in 1950 and you put batteries on a Moore's law curve, batteries today would have the energy density of antimatter annihilation. <laughs> that is to say, you could run E equals mc squared inside the battery and you get all the E out, none of that crappy lead left over from a nuclear reaction, okay? Well, they probably wouldn't let you take it on an airplane, but. Um, and we're not on Moore's law curve, okay? We're not getting twice as smart, our eyes aren't getting twice as good every 18 months. Once we have totally saturated the cortex with total sensory overload, what next? Well, of course, the computers may talk to each other, but maybe they don't have that much to say. I'm OK. Are you OK? Yeah, I'm okay. OK. Is your furnace still on? Yeah, my furnace is still on. OK, it's cool. The only sensors that are really interesting are video cameras, <laughs> okay. surveillance cameras. So yeah, root for the surveillance society. Right? Okay. So, I want to talk, I want to finish with a slide on the developing world. I think what's going on now has a very strong societal imperative. We are getting communications everywhere. Never mind the industry structure, but there's going to be pressures from government and industry. We're going to get stuff everywhere. But the question is how fast? It's gated by CapEx, okay? And of course, capital and labor and things like that. If the cost of optical stuff comes down, deployment is going to be quicker in the developing world, but is that good for your industry? I think there's an interesting question, which is, what does the Moore's Law curve look like, especially when you imagine that the uptake is being driven by build-out in the developing world? What is the rate of cost reduction that actually is best for your industry but also gets us fiber in the developing world as fast as possible? That was my last slide, but I'm going to give you one more fact because I'm looking at the clock and it says I have one minute and 55 seconds, which is where is the money coming from that is driving the value? I really only know two places. And this has nothing to do with how it trickles down and how much of it ends up in the ISP and how much of it ends up down there. It comes out of the consumer's pocket. They pay for internet access. They pay for television. They pay for Netflix. Okay. And it comes out of advertising. Okay. There aren't really many other big pots of money out there. And I know some of my ISP friends look at Google and say, God, Google drips money. Can I have some? I had a quote from a European operator. It was about that level of sophistication. So I'm just going to give you a couple of numbers to think about. These come from the Interactive Advertising Bureau. In the United States, per broadband house, the monthly interactive ad spend is about 36 bucks a month. Is that a lot or a little? Well, when I first heard it, I said, I'm not worth that. <laughs> but then I said, ah, that is supporting the entire advertising-sponsored ecosystem on the internet, which, of course, is the thing that makes it so exciting. I said, wow, it's actually low. The entire free advertising-sponsored ecosystem on the internet is living on 35 bucks a month. Now go to Europe. Well, it depends what country you're in. UK, Scandinavia, the numbers look the same. Go to Southern Europe, where there's less of e-commerce today and the economy suck, $10 a month. 
If you're trying to look at a revenue stream that is not coming out of the consumer's pocket, you're trying to tap in a revenue stream which is being driven by e-commerce, which is being driven by advertising that looks like 10 bucks a month. There's not enough money there to subsidize the industry. Now try the developing world. The consumer is your friend and it's your only friend. 